in in my country was like seen as extra extras. I need an extra so we can like put him on fire. It's like what? You don't need an extra. You need an expert. You need someone that has experience that is going to make your production safe. That you're not going to have an accident. That you're going to like accomplish your take and your director is going to be able to have the confidence to shoot the way he wanted and the thing is going to work that's what you need and that's going to make saves you a lot of money this is an interview with marco zoror marco is a martial arts action star and filmmaker known for films like kiltro undisputed three john wick four and Fist of the Condor. We talk about his film career, which really took off in Chile, as well as his work in Hollywood and his training regimen. Marco, thank you so much for taking time to uh, talk to us and uh, share your insights as a filmmaker and a, uh, an action star. Really excited to talk to you. Thank you again. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, the first time I saw you was in this movie that I I picked up on a video CD called Hard as Nails. And, uh, I, and I remember uh, seeing, I was reviewing movies at the time. And I thought like, man, this movie's really trash. But there's this one guy in the end fight. <laughs> and he moves really well because we were we were trying to do this Hong Kong movie style. And it was you. It was you doing this end fight because uh, you were really tall. And I was like, this is really impressive. Uh, was that your first foray into action filmmaking? Yes. And I haven't, I never talk about it though. This is very curious because, you know, it's like, yeah, man, that's funny, man, that you, you, you talk about it. It's a very big surprise. Uh, no, it just, it just happened. I remember, you know, training in the old times in the LA and knowing some people from the stunt community and they invite me to participate. And, and they have like, they, they brought me as a stunt man for the, the lead you know uh, but then they also gave me a little appearance as a, one of the henchmen right and then you know they for some reason they start adding me more scenes and more scenes so i was i end up being all the time next to that big guy right and then i have my little moment you know that i have a fight scene and, and then and all of that was not part of the original script you know, so I was very happy. Imagine that was my first like interaction on camera in the U.S. It's like, yes, man, that's 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 cool, man. I haven't even I, I don't even remember like the scenes or stuff like that. I, it was crazy. Well, I'll try and dig it up to try and embarrass you a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's actually but I remember I remember reviewing it and uh, and in the review saying, yeah, this movie is like not very good. But there is this one guy. <laughs> in the final scene so uh i think you i think you i don't know for me for me that was the start of my uh marco zero fandom so that's cool well man. done <laughs> that's cool uh, so what what brought you to la in the first place then yeah well i you know first i was in mexico and you know i already made the decision to leave chile right uh and then when I was in Mexico, I started doing like modeling and, and then I received a scholarship in Televisa that it's like, you know, to study and to be part of this, this studio that they make uh, like soap operas and stuff like that. And after six months, they offered me to stay there. But then I said, look, you know, it's like there's no action here. I'm not going to be doing what I love to do. So then I decided to start from zero and move and go to L.A., you know, and, you know, that's so I started from like, you know, uh, I didn't have any connections, anything. I just arrived to LA and I needed to find a job. Remember, I I work in a restaurant as a dishwasher, dishwasher, and then waiter, and then I clean a gym in Sunset Boulevard, uh, Ken's Karate Park. And actually, I, he was the one that showed me JJ's Perry old demo reel. And he was a big friend of JJ. And then I stayed there working for a little bit as a, you know, uh, cleaning the gym to get the key so I can train. And then I start teaching there, start teaching. And then they told me, oh, you, there's a place that you got to you gotta go see. That's LA Valley College where all the stunt people go there. And that's how I started to get in touch with all, all the, the industry. That's actually where I first met you. Uh I think I went there in 2002 or three and cause that was the place to go. That was where all the yeah. stunt guys went and trained. Right. Yes. Yes. It still is. I, 
I kind of hope it is. Um, but uh, maybe the torch has passed to some other place. But uh, but I remember meeting you, and I think I even mentioned I think I even mentioned hard as nails to you. And oh wow! I don't, I don't know if you liked that at the time. <laughs> I don't remember, man. I, I man, it's it was, it's yeah, it's so long ago. But yeah, well, I like Bali College. A lot of stories there, man. All the all the everybody, everybody, Aaron Tony, like John Valera, Andy Chang, like Steve Terada, Arnold. Uh, you know, uh, Lornell Stovall, you know, everybody, everybody, like uh, Dan Sandworth, like it was a nice, nice time, man, nice time, you know, and, and we were just kids, like wanting to, you know, uh, be in the industry and we were training hard, I remember. It was so fun, man. And you, so you, but what, what, how old are you? What's your generation? You were younger when you show up? I'm like, early millennial, so I'm 41 right now. Oh, so you're my same. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just a few ah, years yeah. younger than you. I think I showed up there when I was 20 or so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 But yeah. I, I wasn't as good as you guys because because that was a wake up call for me. You know, yeah. especially seeing a six foot three. I don't know how tall you are. To me, you're seven feet tall because I'm. I'm <laughs> yeah, but when yeah. I see guys like, and I saw guys like you flipping around going like, dang, this is, this is the LA stunt scene. So. But that was where it happened. Um, yeah, well, for me, it happened the same thing. When I arrived from my traditional martial arts, like thinking that I was good, and suddenly I see these guys flipping in. The First of all, I never even knew or experienced that gymnastic floor before. So for me, it was the traditional fighting martial arts, you know, and I was good. You know, I, I was all the time sparring in different schools and I mean, I, and I was good. I was fast. I was very explosive for my size. And I could do like a backflip. That was all, everything that I could do. But suddenly I arrived to this place with this, they have this bouncy floor and then they, and then they catch this air and you see them going in the air and going, doing some crazy stuff. And I'm like, what? Like, man, it was like three days that I almost quit. I was, uh, I was like, that was not good. It was a big like shock. Because I thought, man, I'm never, I lost my whole life. I'm never going to get to that level, you know? And then I just start training nonstop. I was the first to arrive, the last to go, you know? So talk, talk us through then your background. You grew up in Chile. Um, uh, is that where you started martial arts? Yeah. Well, my mother used to, you know, give some uh, speeches in a Buddhist temple in Peru. We, uh, so she received the knowledge from like a very like master, you know, that comes from India. And then she tr she was involved with all these Asian and, and martial arts stuff. And she did Kung Fu over there. And then she moved to Chile. And when I was born, I was born in a karate dojo. I, I was like, she knew that I was pregnant in a karate dojo. So when she was very, when I was very young, like she take me with her and uh, she took me with her to kind of be while she was training. Uh, so she was a very big uh, motivation for me to for for all my martial arts. But then I saw Bruce Lee enter the dragon, and I just went crazy. You know, I was like, "This is what I want to do." I don't know what. I don't know if it's going to be fighting. It's going to be you know. But I I I knew that my life was going to be involved with martial arts. You know, and and I never stopped. So I I grew up there until like I was nineteen. And then I, I left to Mexico and hmm. that happened what I told you, you know, about the modeling and all that. Yeah. Were there any Chilean action films growing up or was no, it? No, 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 not even the movie industry in Chile back then was pretty much, it didn't even exist. They, they did a couple movies through government money. That's, you know, that's not industry. That's just, you know, so it was not even possible to think of making action movies in Latin America, actually. There was never, there was never been action like martial arts fight scenes on movies in Latin America. And so what about the martial arts scene in Chile? Were there a lot of martial arts schools at the time when you were growing up? Yeah, well, uh, like in every country, you find martial arts school everywhere. So, but in my country, it was kind of tough because it was going through a transition because of the military government. Uh, it was prohibited to do to to do martial arts until not too far 
uh, when I was born. So when my mother was training, actually, it was prohibited. So she would go into this underground martial art dojo. So <laughs> that was probably, it, it gave it more like a little cool thing, like, like a movie. It was a, like an underground martial arts school. Whoa, you, know? you were you were a renegade martial arts son of a martial art. That's crazy. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's you know. So I tried to look for different styles, and then because of my, I was so into Bruce Lee that I wanted to learn kung fu. So I wanted to find a kung fu master, but it was hard. You know, it was hard to find. So I started with taekwondo. Then I did some karate. Then I find a kung fu, but I didn't like too much for a while. Then I changed different styles of kung fu. And then I went back to karate because of looking for that master, like the guy that you feel that is really, you know, know what he's doing. You know, it was kind of hard to find, you know. So I, I went through one school to another school, but I was all the time training, training and upset, like my time training in the school was nothing compared to this time that I spent training at my place, you know, and watching movies and like practicing different things. And and so when you were taking martial arts, did you have, were you training martial arts with cinema and filmmaking as a goal? No, no, not even possible, not even a dream in that moment because unreachable, like it was not even something close to think that it was going to be possible things started when i left chile when i was 19 and i left chile then is when i met uh, jose luis mosca and he was a kickboxer champion that was doing these low budget movies for mexico uh, people that live that that cross the border and they they live in the u.s but without but they don't speak Spanish, uh, english so there's a lot of there was a whole industry of movies that they were made for these people in that back then. So with different, like they have their own like movie stars and stuff like that. And there was there were movies that they were sold on the VHS, you know, VHS, uh, you know, like, a, like a blockbuster, right? But there were independent VHS stores only with these Mexican productions that they shoot the movie in one week, pre-production one week, post-production one week, and they have a movie. It was crazy. And it was shot in, fixed, in 16 millimeters. So that was my first experience. I did like I did like five of those movies where I have like little roles. And in one, I was like an agent and I, I got to shoot some bullets and do like a like a role. And I always wanted to find an excuse to fight, but they never let me because they they did they didn't even know how to shoot it, you know. Wow. Uh so I mean, is that so that was that was your introduction to filmmaking then? Yes, that was that was before Hard as Nails. That that was, of course, okay. a, you know, like me. That was the first time that I saw a camera, like you know, in terms of like understanding a set and the whole dynamic. And it was awesome. I love it. I, but I was just so frustrated because I had a common sense, and I was like, "Look, you got all these guys shooting is boring. Why, you know, we can add like this and that." And because of my martial arts, I. I gave them all these ideas. I nah, they they didn't never want to like let me participate of that. I was like so frustrated, and they keep putting me in these roles, like very like, you know. I was like, I wanted to do more, you know. And and every time I was finding, okay, maybe I can. Okay, you want me to walk around that 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 wall? What about if I jump over the wall? Oh, okay, okay. So they let me do things like that, and they, you know. So I was with all this energy that I wanted to explore into this, but. Of course, there was there were movies that are very very low budget and and you know, but they had big distribution and they have their own their their fans and it was crazy. It was very you know, it was it was a crazy experience though. So you end up coming to Hollywood, uh, and you work on uh, Tough as Nails. And what came next for you in Hollywood? Well, I, then my big my big break. I remember. Um, you know, I was teaching at the Valley Total Fitness. Uh, I was teaching martial arts, uh, you know, trying to do whatever to pay rent and the same, the, the scenario that you know. And, and I got, I was in the restaurant working and suddenly I received in the LA Valley College. Uh, this uh, uh, person came to me, he's like, Marco, you want to do stunts? 
And I'm like, yes, sir. And this person was like Andy Chang. And I remember <laughs> when we train, every time that he show up, everybody was like, oh, Andy, Andy. And everybody was training harder. And, and yeah, and he always go there. He would look at me, say hi, but never say anything. And suddenly one, like after like two years, he's like, Marco, you want to do stunts? I was like, yes. And that was to double the rock on the movie, The Rundown. And that was like crazy. And I remember I worked three, I went three days for the rehearsals, you know, and that's where also when I met JJ, where he, we, I did the first day rehearsals and it was so tough. It was so hard, but I was so pumped up and I was so trained that I didn't care. And I remember and did the big mistake of wearing this little shirt like this. And I was the whole day on wires. I didn't came up of that wire the whole day, like doing flips and things. And I was with like blood and bruises here, but I was pumped up. But then I got to recognize when I arrived home, man, I was B. And I, and I told myself, damn, man, if, if tomorrow is going to be like this, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know. But then I realized that it was kind of like the next day they let me rest the whole day and kind of chill. And I remember JJ looking at me and start like having a like a laughing saying, hey, man, you know, you like you passed the test. That was like a test. And they were like they did they did some like crazy pulls and stuff like that. And yeah. And then he told me, man, you're in. And then unfortunately, after the third day, I had to stop working. Because. I didn't have a visa and I didn't have my, I have a visa to work as a model, but not as a, as a stand. So the industry came in and said, look, the stand community, all the, the, the community, SAG and all that, they, they didn't want to let Universal hire me for do that job. So then I'm out again. And, and I already quit my job in the gym and all that. And I didn't know what to do. I was like, damn. But then I told Andy, Andy, I don't want to put you in trouble. I don't want to, you know, uh, thank you so much. And I, inside, I was so frustrated. It's like, this is so hard to have this chance in your life. And then because of this paper thing, it's like, it's so frustrated. But then Andy told me, Marco, don't worry. You're going to, you're going to make, you're going to work. You're going to be here. And then they, they had to do a big audition, call a lot of people to get the job. And, and, and Andy needed to show the studio. No, look, Marco is the guy that I need. So after three months, I lost mo most, almost the whole previous and the whole rehearsals, I lost it because I needed to wait for this process. And then finally, the studio got my visa and they, you know, I was able to do, join the, the, the team, you know, it was, it's, it was pretty wild, man. This, you see, this is this is the problem with being an attractive male. Uh, I don't have this problem, but <laughs> when you when you are demanded by modeling agencies, I guess uh, then uh, then uh, I guess this is a natural side effect, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, after after the rundown, uh, did you go back to Chile and do uh, Kiltro after? Yes. That? What happened is after the rundown, even though it was an amazing experience and I, I feel that I learned so much, like I was like, my instinct was trying to learn everything. You know, I wanted to see how they shoot in the film and and and, and how they shoot the fighting and then the previews and all that. I, I, I wanted to kind of understand this. And to be honest, it, for me, it was like too much. It was a big, was like, man, like I remember my first scene, I had a jump from a cliff. It was crazy. And yeah, I could do it one time. You know, I remember one long shot. It was cool. But then the thing started becoming really deep and like almost high falls and like crazy. And then I'm like thinking, going through this thing. I'm like, look, I've been training my whole life martial arts. And I and I didn't do any martial arts. So I did, I realized stunts, it's a totally different game. Like one thing you could do, you could be martial arts and do fight scenes, but the other thing is to do stunts. And if you want to be successful as a stuntman, you need to know a little bit of everything. You need to know guns. You need to know, ride a horse, ride a bike, know how to drive, you know, and there's specialties and stuff like that. And then for sure, I was like, that was, I've been trained my whole, I love martial arts and I love fighting. And, 
And I realized being a stunt, I'm not going to be doing that much. Like if you, if in your whole career as a stunt, you throw some kicks, then you're lucky because you just did some fighting. And back in the day, back then, today it's def- different because today there's more fighting and martial arts in movies. But back in the day, it was very hard to see a, fa- a, a martial arts fight in a movie, right? So I was in a big trouble there. And I'm like, what I do? And then I can stay doing stunts in the US or I can go back to Chile and do my own movie and, and do my martial arts film that I would love to do. And that's how we, me are, uh, with my friend Ernesto, uh, Ernesto Diaz, that is a writer director, we're like, look, let's make this movie. And then we arrived to Chile and because with some of the money and I brought some investors from the US and then I raised some money in Chile and we did the first movie in Chile named Kiltro. Yeah, that was uh, like, what was, was there an action scene in Chile at this time? Or nothing. Were you just starting, you were just building something from ground zero? From zero, like nothing. Like I, I, I did an audition. So I had to select like different, like martial artists that knows how, like some, some, you know, some, some people that helped that they were very good, like the wrestlers, like they were good to react you know that they do like the WWF in in the US like they they are like it's like a show you know they need to know how to fall and how to sell a hit so i took some of those people and then different martial artists and then we just trained for like 6 months man in chile to do all the previous same thing with the the hand pulls and like boom and all that and we got to learn and rehearse everything and we did that and then we did make the movie it was pretty pretty cool it also was a very good learning experience for me, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, were you bringing a lot of what you had learned from the rundown to the- Yeah, of course. I copy-paste with no money, but but it was a copy-paste of, of what I've learned in the rundown. I was like a big school, you know? So what what inspired uh, your character in Kiltro? Well, yeah, Kiltro for us was like, our version of a martial arts film back in then in being as a and very personal because we were how old we were like this kind of young guys that wanted to tell a story from our country so we picked those locations in chile where there's a lot of mixed cultures that a, a martial arts story can be believable right because we have a whole neighborhood there that there's a lot of mix of uh, Asian people, Korean, Chinese, and also Arabic. And then that's when you can mix all these cultures and you can come up with this crazy story of like martial arts and stuff like that. And and then a little bit of my personality and, and Ernesto, like we're, we're friends from like, we were born in the same day. That was funny though. We went to high school together. So we're very good, good friends. So he kind of know me and you know, and 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 we wanted to put it into like this love story with this girl and this obsessive guy that is very stubborn and try to like conquer the girl. And it was pretty much taking things from our reality, you know, to kind of put it into the story and make this this our first experience, you know. And what about the action style that you guys decided on for Kiltro? Yeah, that was all based and inspired on, on movies that we love and, and styles that we love. Like it's a Japanese animation, like uh, the Westerns. And we wanted to make it very cinematic, you know, like uh, with, with, you know, tell like like in Japanese animation, when you see like an insert of the fish and then you see the guy falling in the, in the background, you know, we wanted to kind of get a little insp- inspired by the Japanese animation style, so that the art, the art, uh, the art of the movie, the the wardrobe and all the aesthetic is very anime kind of feel, right? And yeah, the music kind of a lot of Morricone influence and like very epic, you know, and the the scenarios, yeah, it was a lot of that. And what kind of production schedule did you have for Kiltro? For Kilter, we shot it in 10, 10 weeks. So it was pretty good, you know, for back for back then. Unfortunately, we didn't have any experience of shooting. That was our first movie. Now I see Kilter, it's like, oh my God, with all that time and all, you know, we had some good budget, you know, but well, it's our first movie, you know. 
uh, now it's like having 10 weeks, it's, it's, it will be luxury, you know, to shoot. Yeah, it's an interesting point because, I mean, even on even on long shoots in America, if you get four weeks, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot. So, so it, it must have gone over well uh, because you then did Mirage Man with uh, Ernesto as well. Um, yeah. Um, it's a very different style of action. Yes. Uh, yeah, the thing is that, well, it didn't do that. It didn't do that good on business, but it did good on like, you know, um, quotes and reviews and like we're getting this buzz right and uh, the thing is that we that was that's a story that's kind of boring but we had a, a a U.S. partner that it was kind of like in the dark side so we didn't realize and after Kilcho we decided to do this very little movie called Mirage Man that we didn't even wanted to throw in the theaters Kilcho was so much, was so much tension with investors and money and problems and stuff like that. So we're like, look, man, let's let's just go back to the roots. Let's go out into the street and let's shoot for we like we didn't, there's no money, there were almost no money. Very, very simple, right? Almost documentary style. So then, of course, I and I told Ernesto, man, what about you know a superhero, but a real with no money, no nothing. But so we got to think on a story. What will justify someone to go to the street, put a mask and start being a, a superhero? So then Ernesto gave it a thought. In one week, we had a treatment and we shoot that movie with a, not even with a, with a script. We shoot it with a sequence of action, like a, like a skeleton of the script. Scene one, scene two, scene three, this happened, this happened, this happened. And, and then we were just improvising and shooting like a documentary style. And then the fight scenes, we didn't do any re, uh, any uh, previous. We were just on the go. So I had the same team that I trained for the kill show now, but we were connected more. And we were like improvising on set. It's like, okay, guys, boom, here. You attack me. How are you going to attack me? Like that, okay, boom, bah, I'm going to attack you. Okay, yeah, okay, let's shoot it. Okay, well, that work. Go, go to this angle, boom. Okay, you I, attack me another way. No, that you did. we did it We did it in the last shot. Attack me another way. Okay, bah, boom, bah. And, and we did that dynamic for Mirage when it was such a big difference, you know, in terms of the feel of it, you know. Did you modify your um, your style for this kind of action? Yes, it was. It's it was more like bro, uh, direct. It was like more, like real. Like we needed to go really to make it feel that as real as possible. Adding some martial arts and some like tricks and stuff like that, but. To, to be very down to earth because of the story, you know? You play an everyday man in, in uh, Mirage Man. Um, you're very tall, you're in great shape. How do you, as a, I mean, look, I'll be honest, you, you're, you're, kind of a, you're kind of a unique physical uh, person. How do you act like an everyday man in a film like mm -hmm. Mirage Man? Because mm -hmm. you have the face mask, that's one thing. Uh, but as an actor, what did you, what did you do? Mm. Well, I don't know. It's like when you, well, the story is a bouncer. The story kind of justified this, this physique and this obsessive train guy. And that, and and again, this is the ability of Ernesto of putting me on a position where I don't have to do much. You know, I just gotta be myself in this reality. And that's that's what I love about working with Ernesto. He knows me so much. So he goes, okay, Marcos, crazy with the diet, with nutrition, with his training, he's obsessive. Okay, now how I can bring that into this, this story? So then you guys, you guys, you have these scenes where I'm training in my thing and I'm measuring my calories on the board. I've done that. That's 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 how I live. But that also works for this character that, you know, you're a bouncer and you got to, you know, all the time work and be, you know, intimidated. It, it it makes sense that this guy is connected with all these other things. See, so then I believe is the ability of of doing the right role instead of, you know what I'm saying? 
I think that's what has been what I've been doing with with Ernesto when we started our career with with our Chilean movies, you know, kind of identify that side of me that I can explore and maybe go deeper to put it into this other story on this this fantasy story, you know. Did you bring anything then from your experience in LA working day jobs and trying to be a martial arts or on the side? Exactly, exactly. All the frustration working as a bounce, as a as a waiter. No, no waiter, a bus boy. I was so pe- like illegal, no 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 papers back then when I just started. And I arrived, I remember arriving to this restaurant, cleaning the whole restaurant leave everything set up for the for the waiters because when you're about you're a bus boy you you help the waiters right and then your whole salary is the tips that the waiter give you at the end of the night but what happened was i arrived i clean i did all that and then the owner of the restaurant's like nah you know today is not going to be too busy you can go mm-hmm. home man i was that walk back home i was so pissed i was like but why? I already clean. I already tell everything. Why you not just let me to help to I, I, I so I can be tipped? What's your problem? You're not even gonna pay me. I I I, I, I was so frustrated to t- to try to understand why she did that. If she knows the situation, man. So of course you connect with those frustrations, and then you there are very nice uh, tools, you know. Because you kind of know how you are when you're in those situations. So then, it, you know, it's familiar, you know. There's a there's a lot of raw action in Mirage Man. Uh, you do real contact hits on people. Yes. Um, what inspired those contact hits and how do you do them? Yeah, well, for us was like, look, we don't have budget. We don't have special effects. We don't have, but what, what we have that we're martial artists for real. And when you guys all hear fight, you guys all hear spar, man, this is what we have that nobody have. And we need to understand that there's no bad intentions here. And I talked to this team and they were in and they, and, and, and they got into this thing, you know, they wanted to get hit. And and I wanted to get hit because it was kind of like our our only thing that we had for this movie to be different, you know. And they go for it. And 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 of course, when when we knew that the camera is not going to show and it's not going to feature the hit, we didn't need to. But of course, the ones that we wanted to feature, we just we just went for it. Like a like a the big stunts, the big falls, the big things to the cars where okay i'm gonna get hit by for real by this kick and we're gonna make we're gonna make we're gonna make sure we show it good so people can appreciate it so that was our own that was that was the whole challenge of the movie you know and especially because we were doing a lot of improvising things so they they knew that i needed to feel that adrenaline when they were coming to me to be able to to kind of have this impact you know and, and having this realism, because sometimes I even change in the spot. So they were attacking me and they needed to be ready because I was going to hit them so we don't make mistakes and we don't need to re- record many times. They just, whenever they feel the hit, they just go with the hit instead of like, oh, it was a miss or it was not a miss, you know. What were you doing in terms of stunt training with your team at that time? Because you have, are these still the the guys with the wrestling experience yeah yeah uh there was the same team as the the, the one that we the, we select and we train uh, for kill troop so the thing is that this team then we stayed training and then we did mirage man and then what happened is that different local productions for soap operas or commercials start asking me marco you know i needed to do like a action thing in a commercial i need a guy to be run out by a car and then I start acting like an agent or like a stunt coordinator in Chile to bring this team because they were already trained and start making some money and fighting for their money. Like they were like, hey, I gotta run, I gotta uh, run a guy with a car. I gotta do a car hit, and but we don't have much budget. How much you have? I have fifty bucks. I'm like, what? No, man, just just buy a doll in the Home Depot and just run it by the, with the doll, you know. 
And I start making fun. Like, look, man, you got this is a special thing, and you guys have to pay what is worth because this is professional. It's not in in my country was like seen as extra extras. I need an extra so we can like put him on fire. It's like what? You don't need an extra. You need an expert. You need someone that has experience that is going to make your production safe. That you're not going to have an accident. That you're going to like accomplish your take and your director is going to be able to have the confidence to shoot the way he wanted and the thing is going to work that's what you need and that's going to make saves you a lot of money so you need you need to raise your budget go talk with your production and then come back to me so we i did that for that i, I fought for that for a little bit and then they start understanding and then i assigned one of them a verne that he continued with this kind of stunt team and 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 working for years you know, uh, because then I, I, I start traveling and I couldn't stay anymore with them, you know, um, and then they continue doing their, their, their thing, you know, and they're working some shows and they were doing all the shows, every commercial. I, there was the only people with experience doing this in Chile. So it was pretty cool, you know, I felt very happy and every time I see them working, I, I felt very happy for that, you know. So you were actually inspiring Chilean filmmakers to make action films. At least giving them the, the, the possibility that they can write something a little bit more adventurous <laughs> and it could be made. You know what I'm saying? So uh, there's a uh, there's a fan question here. Um, he asks, uh, do Chilean films have their own unique flavor of filmmaking and how does that translate to Chilean action cinema in particular? Well, Chilean cinema, it's, I believe, just been starting to grow in the last couple of years. You know, uh, I cannot say action cinema in Chile. That doesn't exist, in my opinion. The only action movies that are being made are the ones that I've done with Ernesto with, with fighting and martial arts. They just did one uh, not too long ago, uh, but you know, it's the action, it's, it's, you know, I think it needs more, it needs more, more people doing it and the industry needs to grow. There's, there's just no enough for people to get better and to train and to have the budget and to people to dedicate, you know, if you don't have a lot of production, then there, you don't have people that can specialize on things. And that's the problem, you know? So hopefully now with, all the productions that Netflix and Amazon are doing everywhere. And they are shooting now much more stuff in Chile. Like production is it's escalating in the last couple of years because of streaming. I feel that is the moment where this can start happening, you know, and and, and people start being more uh, specialized in different specific things. But today, I, I'll say as an action cinema or action scenario, mm, no, I will not, not yet. So going back to, uh, you know, 2007, 2009, uh, Mirage Man and Mandrill, um, was it was it fairly easy making, fil making films in Chile for you? Yeah, because there is good team, there is good, there is good talent in Chile to shoot a movie because there's a lot of commercials and there's a lot of very good qualified people. It's just the action is what's not where that's where I come in because with the experience of working in, in, in LA with Andy, with JJ, with all the, 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 the you know, and my, my experience as a martial artist, then, you know, I can grab this very good team of people that know how to shoot movies and then we can make these movies that are that looks good and they have good quality and they're amazing. But the problem is, and, and not the problem, but the only way is I really become as a co-producer, kind of like I need to prep. I need I cannot be an actor in the movie because it cannot it, it will not work. I need to be in the pre-production so I can I can kind of guide the whole prep for the movie because if not if i give it to an, a company today hey hey guys produce this action movie and I, i'm gonna bring an actor that does all the action is they're gonna fail and they try to do it and, and that's what happened 
Why? Because they don't understand that an action movie needs previous, needs preparation. How many days? Okay, this scene that in the script is like maybe half a line, it's a scene that needs to shoot three days. You know, but no, they just do the old way. Oh, it's only one line, so we just need 30 minutes to do this fight scene. And they, it sounds basic for us because we, we know, but in down there, they don't understand that. And they don't know, okay, this thing, this scene means this much prep, this much shooting time, this much stunt team, this much this, and then, and, and that's where it's, it's, it's not like they don't have the expertise as a filmmaker. They just don't know the action fighting filmmaking, you know, the process. So for you, uh, for you, though, previs, is that an important part of the process or do you like doing things on the spot? It depends. If I if if I have a good stunt team around me, I'll I don't care about doing stuff in the spot. You know, if I have a good team, but I love previs, though especially when you don't have much money and you need to to save time you know uh, because of course a previous it gives you the guide and you just you know i like what i like to do is i do the previous then we took, take the frames we put all the pictures on the board and we go okay which one we need okay these are all the white shots so change the lens we're going to use this lens we're going to shoot all that this side of the of the world okay so what so we have take number four, take number 10, take number that. Okay, the lens and we do all the whites and then, okay, now we're going to the, the, the shorter ones. So then you scratch and at the end, you know you have all your puzzle, right? It's, it's kind of, it's very practical for all the team to understand what's going on. I love that. I love to have that luxury and, and do it, you know? Does, uh, does Ernesto get involved in the previous process with you? Yes, yes, yes. He as a director always gives me the vision of, you know what, in this one, I would love to do some some slow motions because there's going to be some dialogue and the fight I imagine this way. For example, the last movie we did, The Fist of the Condor, he kind of wrote a lot of the fight scene. So then I, I feed him with the chunks of the pieces of the choreography and then show it to him. We, 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 we put, we make the previous and then he goes, oh, you know what? This part of the previous maybe can be here or maybe we can cut here to do the scene here. And then maybe this one is to, we need to go a little closer. It's a little wide. So he all, we all, it's a co-creation. So that, that previous process, in my opinion, is ideal. When you can have a director who has a good visual eye and good storytelling, who can kind of match the skills of the filmmaker. Did you, now, when working in Hollywood, in your experience up to that point, did you find that the previous process worked like that? No. No, no. I've done many productions where, you know, the previous is one thing and the end result happens to be something totally different. And you go, well, you know, in most most of the times it's, it's a fail. You know, it's like they really fail, right? Uh, and you see a lot of frustration in the stunt team, in the, the fight coordinator, because... I feel that there's not a lot of communication between the process, like the, 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 the fight coordinator, the director, and then the editor, and then the end product. For some reason, somewhere it gets diluted where it ends up being whatever, you know? But in some other, no. Some, like, for example, of course, uh, Undisputed 3 was a beautiful, like, another big, big learning process for me was Undisputed 3 working with Isaac, with Scott, with Lornell, and see how they do things. For me, that was amazing, man. And actually I used that and then I did Redeemer. And if you see Redeemer has a lot of the fighting rhythm that and very similar to Undisputed. Of all my movies, I feel that's kind of very similar to Undisputed rhythm of fighting, of camera work and all that. It's pretty cool. Where, where do you think previs in Hollywood falls apart? Or I, I guess the question is, where do you think that disconnect happens between the previs and the final product? What goes wrong? I feel that in some productions, because it depends, like there is, there are ones that are not, but let's talk about the Hollywood mainstream and not the ones that our friends work because that's our amazing, you know? 
let's take them out let's take all the all our friends out of this conversation like the before 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 87 11. <laughs> let's talk it's like like uh before and after 87 11 uh, dynamic or john wick or like all this kind of thing right uh what happened is like i feel the stunt coordinators and the 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 fight uh, coordinators they have a very clear long time ago when but the problem is the power there's power like then you have the director i don't know if it's something of ego or not knowing they just receive this and they don't really value it they don't understand that they're just getting something that is precious so they they see it ah it looks cool but they for some reason go back to their mm, way of shooting a master and then we're going to cover the details and then that guy give it to the editor okay you you solve this mess i'm i'm going to see what you do and then i'll give you some corrections so then you have that process it dilutes from the director then to the editor so the editor is is getting this material he may most likely never done martial arts he doesn't understand what, if that kick it was a kick or is a knee or is just a step so then the guy is just gonna feel the rhythm and he's gonna put together this mess the best way possible and then the director is gonna look at it and most likely he's gonna be ah yeah that looks cool it works he does not not, not doing not being a martial artist so now after many many years i feel now you you're finding five directors there's like this new credit happening in the industry when, and that's why you're seeing better fight scenes lately in 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 big movies but not too long ago you know it's because they are kind of finally understanding that is a different animal it's a different game the director you you could be very good director but you need you, this is another this is another thing you know and and i feel big part of that is what chad did with john wick and that's why in all the interviews people ask me and i like look man i think it's before and after chad sahaski with john wick is in a before after in the industry in the world period because he really he really make this point very clear with the one two three and four movies without failing so it's not ah one ah cool the second one the third one like when you do it four times in a row like that is you have a point so the industry is listening and now and now he's opening doors to so many stunts uh people to be directors to even write to do like he opened the door for for the industry so that he opened like this so the whole industry now are looking to stunts in a different way they're going like oh these guys they just not know how to fall these guys they know what they're doing they <laughs> they know what to you know yeah, so they have, uh, they have an eye right they I have mean, an eye exactly yeah exactly well, they have an eye you know Hopefully they end up in the marketing departments and studio heads. I mean, that's where that's where the power is still coming from, right? Exactly. And, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But at least, at least, you know, the the the, the guys up there they want to make money. And if they see, oh, the audience is responding to this, I I, I start I need to start paying more attention to these people. Like like the 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 gladiator phrase win the crowd and you you win your freedom <laughs> like if you have all the fans man going like this then what are they gonna do you know at the end it does that's the reality you know uh let's go back to uh let's go to mandrill now uh you went in a very different direction as a performer uh the action's very different um you're a secret agent this time yeah, yeah, yeah. same director though yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was it a challenge for you going from this sort of underdog character to a James Bond type of character? I, I, yeah, I believe that was my biggest challenge in as a as a role because it was a lot of it was it was funny at times, romantic, cheesy, but emotional, and you know, it was it was. You know, it was a very fun ride, man. I guess I gotta say, it was a very fun ride. 
uh, and same thing, I think life, like maybe if I would do the opposite, first Mandrill and then Mirage Man, it would not came up the same way. I feel these movies represent some places that I was in my life. And that's why we kind of made them. Like Ernesto, when he saw me at that moment, I had a relationship and I was kind of going through some dark places and, and he felt, okay, the, he now is emotionally prepared to do a role like this. And yeah, man, and it was pretty cool. It was a pretty good experience, man, you know? So how did you approach the action this time? This time, well, this time was a mixed. So we did some previous and we did some improvisation. So we we grabbed some of Mirage Man experience. We kind of like it. We like that feel of the mirror of Mirage Man, but at the same time, we love that kind of cinematic feel appeal of Kiltro. So then we we're like, okay, how we can mix these things? And then we kind of, you know, took a little bit from the both worlds and put this together, you know. You're a uh... You're still doing falls in this movie. <laughs> you're you're still being a stuntman. Um, is was production okay with this? Oh yeah, man. Like the, the, if it's me, who's gonna like? I, I don't have a double in Chile. Like I don't. It's for me. It's not possible to do another way. You know, when I do my mark, mar even like in Fist of the Condor, I did my whole, everything, all my stuff. You know, so in Chile, I gotta do it. If I don't do it, then I, we gotta change the scene. What was the most challenging part of doing Mandrill? The most challenging, um, emotionally, I think, was very challenging. In terms of fighting and action, yeah, well, every movie is challenging, man. You know, when 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 the movie is relying on your physical ability, I train really hard for that because I understand that I cannot fail. My my athleticism needs to be on point because the movie relies on it. Like I, if I need to do a fight scene the whole week, my body needs to be ready for that, you know. And that's why I train really hard as an athlete to to approach these films because if I don't do it, then there's no scene. And and I kind of more used to that. But the emotional, you mix that with emotional, it was pretty tough. You know, because you were drained emotionally and physically. So that was that was that was hard. You know? Because you're wearing a lot of different hats. I mean, you're you're designing action, you're I mean, you're calling the shots a lot of the time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I gotta keep the adrenaline and the team up and the you know, and it's a low budget. So you're helping bring the coffee, you're helping moving the lights, and then boom, wardrobe, and then boom, relax, and then again go action, boom, boom, boom. And so yeah, it's uh, it's pretty intense. It's like going to war, you know, that it, every movie that I finish is like, this is the last movie I do. When I do in Chile, it's like, that's it, man. Like it's, and it, I, I always, after the movies, I go boom. It's like, or I lose my voice or like, I, it's crazy. It's a big, big demand, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I always tell my, myself that too. Uh, never Never quite works out that way though. Yeah, I never like it, it, until, as soon as you start feeling good again, you go like, okay, man, we should, where we can go now? What we can do, you know? I mean, for you, when like when is that moment when you feel I have to do that again? It's just it's finds moments of inspiration for some reason. It has it always has to do with a process that I'm in my life. For example, then after Mandrill, it was a long time, right? that we didn't do anything in Chile and then we do Redeemer. So after, like between Mandrill, I remember did, that I did Undisputed. So there was one fight scene that we did on Mandrill to add more action that I did after Undisputed. So I kind of learned a little bit of Undisputed and I put it, that is the fight in the parking lot with the with the master of uh, Jiu Jitsu. Then I finished him with a, with a choke with his own jacket. That was after that was that shot was after undisputed. So if you feel the rhythm of that fight, it's a it's, it feels different style than the other fights of the movie. So for me, it was a before and after undisputed for sure in my view as a filmmaker as a and how to put together a fight scene, right? So to that in and to the half of Mandrill, 
it was undisputed. So then, then you know, because of the business and this partner that I told you that we didn't see any money back from all these three movies because we did these three movies very close together. And we just seen the money that we were making in Chile, but not in the other places. And we're seeing the movies everywhere. Like if the Kilter was in HBO in the US, Mirage One was sold for over 10, 90, 90 countries. And it was very successful. And we're not, we were not able to get the money back to pay the investors. So it was very frustration for me because I felt, look, this is successful in one side, but then money-wise is not successful. And I, and I, and I couldn't continue doing this. Because like, how I'm going to tell my people to make a movie if I don't even believe in the business anymore? So I went to, I changed my my way. And I go, look, I'm going to be a fighter. This movie thing is not working. It's not going to work. I cannot do another movie again, you know? So I start training as a fighter to maybe fight in the UFC. And I, and I was very excited training and i i spent like five years training very hard like wrestling mma you know like run and pound and i, I did no gi and all that and when i was about to fly to peru to train with this master tony de sosa that it was a guy that trained in this you know very like like the master in the movies right that he fought in the ufc actually he went to chile and i met him and he was like an amazing with jujitsu and all that and wrestling and you know, I was like, okay, I'm ready to go. I want to do my first fight, right? But then I receive a call from Robert Rodriguez to do Machete Kills. And that's when I went like, uh oh, I guess I gotta give I gotta give another shot to this movie thing. And then I did Machete Kills, you know, and he told me that the people that I was working with, it was not legit, right? And that was an eye opener for me. And I realized that all that bad thing money wise with my movies was not because of the movies it was because this guy was not doing what he was supposed to be doing. So he was not like doing the right things. Right. So that gave me a little one hope of trying to warm on more time and do another movie again. So I said, look, I didn't fought in the UFC, but I've learned all these techniques. You know, uh, you know, let's make a movie and let's let's do an MMA kind of approach to our fight. Let's do something real, more violent, more something that that justify this type of fighting. And that's how Redeemer came, you know, and and we did this movie. So when you uh, when you got when you did Machete Kills, uh, what kind of input? What kind of input were uh, were you given on doing the fight scenes? Oh, that was fun, man. Well, uh, that was J actually that was the same the time the second time that I saw JJ after lo all these years in the rundown, he was part of the action team of uh, Machete Kills, and we worked together. We did these fight scenes. No, for me, it was like we kind of interact and and communicate, and they have this fight scene for me, and and I add my input, and I, oh, I can do this, I can do that, and then, and it was it was demanding because it was hot, it was crazy hot, of course, you know. Uh, and we were shooting in there was two sets so it, we were doing the final fight in this set and the fight with the clones in this set so we were like action ah, bah, 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 cut reset and then i ran to this other set action bah, 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 cut reset going to the back like it was like that but it was crazy and we were like running and everybody was like running wardrobe, makeup, everybody was running back to back to the set. And I was like, man, I, I went into this zone, man. And we, we was, it was a fun one, man. It was fun. And well, actually I remember pull, like I had a little pull. I, I never gonna forget this JJ got my back here because I'm doing this uh, scene where I'm with a shotgun. I walk, they fire me, bah, bah, bah. I hit one guy, boom, I kill another guy. I do a court screw with the shotgun in my hand. It was pretty tough because, you know, it's hard to, you know, to spin when you have like a shotgun, right? Land, shoot someone, and then do a psychic. Bah. So I did that. Then I did a second time. And I think in the third or fourth time, I felt like a little tweak in the landing of the cork. And I'm like, ah. And then it's like, hey, we go one more time. And then JJ is like, he came to Robert's like, man, I think we got a flat tire. <laughs> you know, I know we got a flat tire. We got a flat tire. 
I was like, oh, no, no, no. We, we just need to just tell him to review the thing, but we don't do the jump. We already got the jump. I was like, oh. And I was like, and, you know, that was, he saved me because I think one more jump with that leg, it would have not be good. So then I, get, I had like a little days to recover and then no problem. It was just like a little, a little small pull that in a couple of days was, was okay, you know. But it, it, it was because it was a lot of uh, hot. So I was sweating. It was too much, very hot, dehydrated, you know, with the, with the suit and all that. It was pretty, pretty intense. What are the challenges when fighting a star like Danny Trejo? Well, there's, yeah, you know, you have to always to make it look good, but be safe at the same time. Uh, so, yes, it's, you know, you usually, it's not, when, as a martial artist, it's, it's, you get to be very, like, um, sensitive on how much they're willing to take in the fight scene. So I always like to start, start very light and then build it up a little bit and then ask them all the time and see their feedback and if they're comfortable or not. Because some actors, they don't like the, to feel, but others, they do. I work with, um, you know, for example, with Keanu, like he loves to feel the thing, you know, and he asks you for more and all that. It's very, very cool. But some other actors are not martial artists. They, you know, they they rather be more in the safe side and it's cool, you know, but that's why, you know, that's, I think that's what we as a stunt community understand and we train, you know, it's like, we know how to control ourselves to have, you know, to make it look good without even touching, you know. I wanted to go back to uh, Undisputed 3. Um, so you played a villain. Uh, that's a that's a little bit of a role shift for you. What was it like going from hero to villain? It was fun, man. It was fun. I'm never gonna forget when I got the script and I and Isaac called me and said, Marco, uh, yeah, I, I, we want you to fight Scott in this movie. And uh, and then I read the script, and I had this acting coach, very good. He, he and and he was like Marco, man. Hearing the script is like you're big and you're muscular and you're strong it's like no the the lead is already like this right go let's 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 tell them the opposite and it was my first like big deal role i was like are you sure we're gonna just say this it's like yeah yeah let's do this i i can do this and then we start rehearsing and and, and doing the suave more like the snake slippery kind of weird guy and when i told uh isaac he's like i love it yes I, because I didn't know what he's going to say, because it was totally different of what was in the script. And we just went for it. And it was fun, man. It was such a fun experience, you know, to dance. And I still remember, I still remember uh, Lorel telling me on the set, Marco, don't dance again. Please don't dance again. <laughs> it was so funny, man. We we're like, yeah, it was, it was fun, man. It was fun. That, 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 that character came up pretty, pretty fun, you know? But I wanted to make it where I wanted to do something different. You know, I, I wanted to not be just bad. You know, I, I wanted to have fun. This guy is, is good. It's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's not the common bad guy we see in the, this type of movies, you know. I think that's what made it memorable is that not only are we used to you know we're used to the trope we're used to that kind of like typical big dude character but then uh yeah you brought something really interesting so uh and uh talk more about integrating uh the mma into your action uh was this also part of your training at the time as a martial artist i i, I maybe was starting not too many years but i was already into it uh i was already exploring and I think after Undisputed, I really, you know, was, I, I, I have a, a side, a, a little bit of time lost there. Sequence of events, I'm not very clear what was first. But yes, because I did the fight with uh, Umberto Norambuena, that he was my teacher in No Gi. So I did the fight with him in Mandrill after Undisputed. So I, I know that for Undisputed, I was already kind of starting to have some experience and fighting and doing some MMA. Yeah. 
but it was just maybe just starting. How do you modify your movement to account for people who are shorter than you? And is that ever a challenge for you? Well, no, yeah, I try to, I no, you know what, I actually, it, I, I like because it's faster. It is, for me, it's, I feel even com more comfortable because they, they're usually faster. Big guys, I feel like I'm waiting all the time. And, and, and in my movies, you know, for example, if you see Fist of the Condor, if you see, like, I, I, I usually fight a little smaller people because I need professional martial artists. And it's very hard to find a tall fighters like, like me. So I actually feel more comfortable. I had, I fought much more times people smaller than me than people my side or even bigger. I haven't even fought a bigger, let me think. Yeah, maybe Cain Velasquez. Well, that's an ex that's that's different because Cain Velasquez is pretty good. I I did this fight with him in the Green Ghost, and he was man, he was good, man. He was he was fast and like, yeah, that was a good experience. That was the I will say the only like big guy my side that I that I feel that I was able to put some speed and like feel that I didn't need didn't have to be waiting all the time, you know. So how did you develop your skills as an acrobat? And when did that training really start for you? That started when I arrived to LA Valley College. I, I did a little bit before in Mexico when I met Roberto Perez, uh, that he he was the first time that I saw like the 720 kick or like the flash and all that, the, the, the butterfly twist. Uh, but then I, re I remember arriving to the LA Valley College. That's when we, I started like training. And that was like 20 years old when I, you know, I was more into the traditional fighting and like at the most like spinning, jumping, spinning hook kick or like a backflip, but never like this crazy cork, cork screws and like all these, this these moves. Um, back then, they, I remember when I arrived was Steve Terada was, starting to do the first double twist double uh butterfly twist that was like the thing like it was every time she did a butter double butterfly twist I'm like whoa you know back in the day yes uh core screw was like a big thing you know i remember so and i when i when i saw that i was like damn this is basically impossible and you know i i end up like kind of learning at least the basics of, of it you know so let's let's go to Redeemer now. Um, you have brutal fights in Redeemer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Way more violence than this. What drove the decision to uh, to have that level of violence? Well, we, because it, there, it was a theme that I felt that we didn't touch with Ernesto with the, our previous movies. Like we wanted to do like a straightforward classic action, like. You know, and especially what I was doing, I was telling you, I was going into MMA. We wanted to feel real. We wanted to to now not play around, you know. So we explore in this character where, you know, there's no, there's no, it's more straightforward. You know, it's not, we're not having much fun. We try to have some comic relief with the villain. But the movie was pretty straightforward. And that's why it's funny because there's some people that, they think that's my best movie and there's people that they don't like it too much because of that. So that same thing is what divides the audience that like that movie or not. It's so funny that they rather like, they, they like more Mirror Man or Mandrill. And there are people that they love uh, Redeemer and they don't like Mirror Man and Mandrill too much because of that, that thing. So it's very funny how the audience work, you know? So at the end, you just got to do whatever you feel like it because you're always going to have people that like it and people that don't like it. <laughs> yeah, or maybe the same person one day uh, and then the other day doesn't like that anymore. Yeah, yeah. So how do you uh, how did you approach doing the violent gags in the film? Was it all in the script already or was it developed on the spot? Oh, no, the, the, the violent stuff, it was in the script. We were like, okay, let's, you know, we wanted to have this fatality concept right the hook <laughs> and then like the falls and the, the thing with the propeller of the of the boat and yeah we wanted to kind of go a little that side you know like a little bloody 
and then with the with the thing in the teeth and then the psychic <laughs> that stuff is nasty whose ideas are, are those ernesto ernesto usually you know and 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 we we kind of like you know ernesto me when i'm creating the, the choreography we're like we should do this and we we try to see inspirations from different movies like uh, japanese movies or korean movies and I we love we love a, a Asian cinema like Takachi Miike, Takechi Kitano, you know this type of film uh, ins always inspire us in, in in do stuff like that, you know. Let's uh let's just talk briefly about um more about yourself. Um, do you have any other hobbies or interests outside of martial arts and film? Well, I'm a very you know. Training, it's it's important. It's kind of part of my life. It's like my day is set for my training, is set for my routine. I, I'm a very routine guy. You know, my my diet and my nutrition is the other half, I believe, of my day. You know, I pay a lot of attention of what I put into my body uh, externally and also internally. Like, you know, I'm very into that, you know, very na nature. I like that. I like the to follow the circadian rhythm as much as I can, uh, you know, the sun exposed, sun exposure, and then don't put like weird creams or stuff. Like I'm very into all that thing, you know? I feel that our body, it's very powerful. And if we understand this and we take care of it, it's it can surprise us. I went through, I went through a lot of like processes where I felt very, that I was very like, uh, I was injured and I was like with inflammation and all that. And one day a little tweak in nutrition just saved me from a surgery, saved me from a lot of things that obligate me to go deep in studying all these things. And then I went very deep, very, very deep into this understanding the human body in the, in, in all his spectrum, like all the realms, like the physical, the spiritual, the energy, like the energy one, you know, and, and yeah, man, it's been a, a long journey. And that's actually, that's why we did the Fist of the Condor. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get to the, because you're, as you're talking about it, there is this very, uh, it's a very kind of animated world that you're in uh, with that film. And I want to, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but, but, but yeah, but, but to finish your your question about my, my day, what I do, well, I like to go for walks. I, you know, I have a daughter and I like to spend time with her and, and you know, and, and, and live the process uh, with her and uh, it's part of my routine like you know walk cook very simple I you know I cannot even go to the movies now because <laughs> I'm with with my daughter it's you know uh, I, I cannot wait she's old enough to take her to the movies for example um, but then yeah to watch some series I like to chill because of course my training takes a lot of energy so you know uh it's very simple but i i do have like a side thing that i do that i created a long time ago that is like a energy drink not from all natural sources and that's kind of my hobby and i bring i'm bringing it to the us it's in amazon you can order it it's key way mm -hmm. the way to our inner energy that is kind of it's part of the same journey right about my studying nutrition the importance of what you're putting into your body that I was so crazy. I was like, look, I'm drinking water. That's all what I'm drinking. What I will be cool to have something available that I can trust, that I can drink for my training and stuff like that. So I end up creating, uh, you know, my own like energy drink, you know, with all the natural ingredients. So that's something that it takes my time sometimes, you know, to 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 get into there. And, and I, for example, here in Miami, I take it to different gyms you know, and show it to the people on the, you know, very, very, very simple, you know, uh, routine thing. So talk about your training regimen um, and how you stay in shape for movies. Well, I do, I have a coach from like many, many years, Carlos Cardemil, that he trains athletes, professional athletes, not martial artists, different athletes. And he's been teaching me many, many years and training and guiding my training. What I, what we do usually, uh, we did many, many phases. You know, we started a long time ago with a, an adaptation to develop strength for the joints and muscles and all that. 
then we 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 turn into more like explosive type of a training when we have this foundation of strength and now it's very explosive and dynamic i use a lot the polar so i track my heart you know my trainings to understand intensity and recovery so i do for example a lot of kettlebell work elastic band work jump box jumps uh, sprints with elastics so i do high intensity training but without failing for example eight repetitions six repetition of explosiveness and then you change to the other exercise without resting you change so then your heart start racing with these different explosive trainings without burning the muscle in that explosiveness so the objective is to gain speed and power endurance cardiovascular endurance without burning the muscle that that's kind of like the the very try to simplify the, to explain to people what what the training look like and this exercise they rotate so for example one exercise could be even a bench press heavy so you do six four and then you move right away to pull-ups and then you move right away to do sprints with an elastic and then you move right away to do jerks or cleans or uh, box jumps and then your hearts you never let your heart rest da, 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 da. you're keeping the explosiveness up 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 so then what happens is that when you're fighting in a fight scene you're moving you're being explosive and you're you're ready you don't get tired you know i can explode i can jump multiple times in a fight scene you know how it is sometimes sometimes you're like 10 hours fighting you need to have your body to be able to respond you know so talk about um working on sultan you fought against Salman khan in the end um, yes uh, another huge star uh what was that like that was fun man he's such a cool guy he's such a talented guy man how these these actors in bollywood man they sing they dance they they do everything man it's he's a very nice guy and it was a very nice experience working of course again with lornell is always going to be good uh learning process and it was tough though it was an intense fight you know um huge production and they they kind of very they they stay not too much to the previous but they they listen a lot to lornell in this one you know more than i thought because you know you know you see how these big big productions are but if you know they pretty much respect you know i will say 70 percent of the idea of what what was going on and, and it looked good i like the movie i love the movie man the movie is beautiful and yeah it was fun man it was a very fun experience and, and be part of that and to know that industry was beautiful you know yeah what are your what are your views on you know the bollywood action scene right now and the ability of of their action stars when it comes to doing action scenes they're getting they're getting up there man they're doing good stuff they they do they do good stuff you know i i seen this guy i don't know, i don't know his name but this this action star in india that is killing it and he's doing some good fight scenes you know uh he kind of like yeah i i i would love to do something again over there because it's there it's look like now they're they're really putting much more attention to it and it's growing the, I, you know, what what his name i'm sure you know his name Tiger Shroff, the, maybe yes 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 he he's doing good stuff man I mean, he's good it looks like he can move you know and they give you time uh, yeah. How much time did you guys spend on this fight and Sultan? Yeah, well, they, they, that was that fight was like a whole week or something. Yeah, no, they have time. They have. It's crazy the production. They shoot for months and months, man. It's crazy, big, huge production. You yeah, know? it's a, it's kind of a. It can be pretty tough, but man, you get to you get to spend the time. Yes. You know? No, I think they're doing it good, man. I, they're, they're, doing good, they're doing good stuff, you know. So when uh, comparing that to American television, you've worked on shows like Dust Till Dawn, The Defenders, schedules are tighter. Um, yeah, talk about doing action scenes on these shows and what kind of challenges you face. Well, yeah, Defenders was kind of not, not the best experience because I felt that there was not a good coordination 
with that's kind of one of a, a, an example of what I was telling you. Um, I think um, Mike, what was his name? The stunt coordinator. He's gonna come. Matt Mullins. Matt Mullins. He's good. He had he got this beautiful like privies and choreography and all that. But I felt that you know the director was not didn't care what he was saying. You know what he was doing, and we were doing like this fight. We were repeating this fight like multiple times, freezing cold, hitting the ground, doing falls. With the mat, with the camera that I was looking at the camera, I was like, man, this is a waste of time, you know. And and Matt knew that, and he was looking at me saying, man, like I like like kind of feeling like I'm sorry, but I'm like, don't worry, man. We we're here. We're we're in the same team. Don't worry. But it's just frustrating because we love what we do. We all love what we do, right? And we the only thing we want is the best product possible, right? And when you're doing something and you see that they're not like they're wasting time, it's gonna look bad, da da da. You get this frustration and it's sad, man. You know, and it's just because you don't like people are not listening. But I think this is changing. This is changing, and I'm happy for that. You know, it's a process. It's part of the process. In Dust Till Dawn, it was totally different because Robert was ahead and and. He actually, he was not in the, the first day that I should. And he, I showed him a, uh, a little tri uh, previous on my phone that I did with the stunt team. And he, he let me play. He's like, Marco, man, go there, have fun. And I, I show him my, the previous, we shoot it with the stunt team. It was great. The, the, the stunt team, they all like, oh, who's this crazy guy that just come here and wants to do a previous. But I had, you know, at least I, I guess they, they all kind of jump into it and, and, and we did it and, and he loved it. And actually we copied the previous exactly the way it was. Like uh, the director there was pretty cool, Eagle, that he kind of, we connect right away and, and he was very cool. And, and man, and, and that fight, I remember the fight when the guy is in the cage and I arrive there and I freeze him and, and, and I release him and then we fight and all that. It kind of, it was pretty cool. It was tight on time, but we were able to accomplish at least all our shots. And it looks cool. You know, I, I was pretty happy with it. And then the other one, Robert directed. So that was pretty cool. You know, I the experience to work with Robert and see how he works. And I show him the previous. We, I also did the same thing. We didn't have much time to do a good previous in terms of all the shots, but I, I, did, I used some pictures and, and, you know, to have like a little map. And man, we accomplished the whole previous. It was pretty cool. And, you know, it was amazing. And of course, he he was directing that and he was calling the shots, but he was looking at my previous and understand the important the importance of my previous in terms of the position for the for the the martial arts techniques. It was more like, look, this kick works from here. That's why let's open here and then we close here because we want to see this kick. Bah, the face looks. So I showed him in the print. He was like, "Oh, that's cool." So he was very into accomplish the fight and 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 it was pretty. It was awesome, man. He was the best, man. That was a be that was one of the good uh, good highlights of my career, man. Working with him on that fight scene. That was the one in the desert when I fight a uh, Saint Holt, and he's saying, "Man, he's pretty cool. He's a he's a good jujitsu guy, man. He's like a black belt jujitsu." Very tough. You know, it's different when you work with an actor that is a martial artist. Mm. Like, it's it, it's just another game, man. It's another mm. game, you know? It's, it's, I think it's always, it's always the case where when finally a, you know, stuntman or a stunt coordinator is able to take a little bit of control on a TV show set and actually run the show, and it, they always get it done. That's the thing. Yeah. And yeah. there do you think that TV is changing because it always seems like they get it and then it it seems to just pull back then. It's like TV then just goes back to its old ways. Do you see change in television happening? Well, for sure, I see it because I I feel that now our productions company for especially like for example the Lionsgate or Thunder Road or these companies that are doing this, like they had the this, like the best example is John Wick, man, and what John Wick is doing, like he's expanding the world and all that, and that's because they have something that works, and why it works because this, this, and that. You have a martial arts director, 
a stand, stand director that, you know, that, that understand what he wants, that cast the right people, that prioritize the things that you need to prioritize, that gives the time to privilege, that gives the time to... So at the end, it's like, okay, this is a formula now. So now we do a TV show. Now we do this. So now what they do, they mimic the same thing with other people, with other stunts. But at the end, they're understanding, that, okay, there is a code. There is a way that we need to do this. There is like a language. And I think that little by little is going is, is going to different places in the industry, you know? And for sure, you know, it's going to be still people that are going to resist. But, you know, eventually I think it's growing for sure. You know, a good uh, fan question related to that, which was uh, he asks, how do you go about selling your films in the world market, particularly with with you as a star? Do you have a strategy for this for? Well. The best I will use the Fist of the Condor because it's the movie that I'm that's my movie that I, I basically one of the investors, one of the creators, and I'm doing the distribution. I'm the sales guy that put it together with the distributor so the other movies were a mess because i the, there was this guy that he was in control that didn't work out but in this one basically what it is is when you have a final product you know there's you you find the u.s distributor and then you go to the markets to basically find territories that wants to buy your movies through a sales agent right so basically that's what it is it's like you can do pre-sales if you have um, the background that people will trust you on do pre-sales. But if not, the only way you have is you just need to put your movie together, cut a trailer, pull poster, and at the end, that's what's going to sell your movie, right? Good trailer, good poster. The, 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 the market will know, oh, I, I can sell this. I cannot sell this. So that's a, that's a very important tool two key elements, right? Now, when you've already done movies and you already have the experience, maybe you can come up with a treatment or a pitch. Hey, look, I have this idea. Oh, this is another movie from Marco or from blah, blah, blah team. Look, they did this movie. We know that they deliver. We, we've been with them. We, you know, they deliver. They, because there's a whole other world that is the deliverables. And that's a lot of filmmakers, especially beginners filmmakers, don't take in consideration. The, tech, the, the quality that you use to shoot your movie, the sound design needs to have a, a, a different like uh, a specifics. So because then they put your movie on a quality control and if you don't pass the quality control, the movie cannot be sold to different territories. So Germany is not going to pay you if you don't pass the quality control. And this big territory will not take your movie. So it's important that you use the right cameras, you light your scenes good, so you don't have like drop frames or too much grain. Sometimes movies have too much grain because it was not well lit, then it's a rejection. And then you can fight it. No, it's an artistic choice or whatever, but some territories don't like that because it looks cheap, right? So then you want to make sure you have a standard in your movie. And then in sound, you need to know, your, you need to have all your tracks very clean, audio, uh, uh, ambience, uh, music, um, folly. So then they can they can take the audio and they can put Chinese or they can put uh, Portuguese. Uh, all these need to be very very professionally made. Even though if you spend very little money on your movie and you put it together, try to use good equipment. Try, that's where you need to put your money. Even if everybody's working for free. Put why? Because then you can sell your movie. And, it, you know, you go to these markets and, you know, you can maybe start your relationship with a small distributor and, and maybe make some money back in the first one, but then get a commitment to do a second one. And that's how you build it up. And in Fist of the Condor, I was lucky to find a Wellgo. Wellgo is a, com a company that understands the niche, understand our crowd, and, and, and they have this uh, also Haya that it's like a house for martial arts, for the movies that we love. So I could not find the best partner with Fist of the Condor. And now, you know, and for the internationals, I have Media Move, that is my sales agent, selling different territories. So I got some good news. We got Germany, we got Korea, Taiwan, Italy, La uh, all Latin America, uh, what else? Yes, and UK. 
that's what we sold so far now in cans and then in you know hoping to sell more territories so you sell territories by territories and you give the rights and then the people distribute the movie and that's that's the process of where i'm right now with the fist of the condo pretty happy the, the dvd just released so you guys can get it in the u.s in amazon you'll get it yeah. into, your, into your house yeah it's I, I think it's one of the greatest martial art films ever made, but we're going to get to that. Uh, oh. got a couple of things to, to do because I, I got questions about that. Um, uh, real quick, uh, you have a fight against Johnny Strong in Invincible. Um, Johnny Strong is one of my favorites because he's this kind of like out of the box kind of action star. Uh, what was the process like for making that action scene? It's a very raw fight scene, but it's very coherent. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like born identity, but cleaned up. Yeah. Well, no, it was just, you know, he's cool. He he's very into the traditional martial arts. He done jujitsu and some kickboxing. So it was, you know, we we did some days of previous and we were like this kind of machine. So we wanted to play this gun thing, but we wanted to make it feel real in this unreal situation. Uh, and yeah, man, you know, I think uh, it flowed good. We there's some MMA, there's some, you know, like a dynamic and kicking, explosive using the guns. It, I I like it. It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. Like we work with the stunt team over there, but of course, you know, I'm a martial artist. He's a martial artist. We kind of put that together ourselves, and then we just shot. We called the shots. It was basically me with the stunt team. Uh, in that movie, I basically co-direct my fight scenes, the, the, the scenes that I was involved because it was part of one of my conditions when I went to that movie because I, I've never been in Thailand. I haven't worked with them. I, I needed to make sure, you know, people can understand my my way of, of, of fighting and shooting, you know. So I really like that they allow me to do that. And they have some cool camera guys. And it was pretty fun. It was, you know, it was a fun experience, man. All right, let's talk about John Wick 4. Uh, you've got this iconic fight basically on a freeway. Uh, <laughs> when I was watching it, my question was, which cars are real and which ones are CGI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, I, don't, I cannot answer you that question because I don't know, but there were a lot of real cars and there was a lot of like interaction with real cars. But there are some swipes maybe that, they were, they were not there when the, the, the moment that I kick him and he falls and it's a car swipe and then I got away. Those cars were not there. You know, it was very dangerous, right? Uh, it was kind of to be that tight. But most of the cars when we're shooting and running and, and all that, that was all real. Yeah. And then when <laughs> I'm running and there's cars coming towards me, that was all real. How do you even prep an action scene like that? Well, no, I was not part of any of the previews of that. They had a previous with uh, the the eighty seven eleven team with some like cars that were moving and like the man, the previous looks pretty cool. They did a very good job, man. It was amazing. The previous was amazing, and yeah, but of course, there's a lot of things that they were they were changing on the spot. Like on my all my fight scene, it was kind of in the previous, but but not, and they they put it together while we were there, and then I changed some moves, and we make it different, and so we're all the time improvising. But it was it was crazy, man. It was there was a wild ride, man, for sure. Were there any changes made from, you know, you talked about the uh, undisputed three script. You read the character. You suggested changes. Did anything like that happen on this one when you first read the script? A little bit, a little bit. When, you know, when I read the script, the guy was uh, French. So, uh, you know, the first thing I was like, no, oh, I got to give this Latino. And, and I, I double checked with Chad. I was like, Chad, can we throw some Spanish? I said, like, yeah, for sure. He'll, he'll love it. So the first scene that I shot in the movie was the one in the hotel, the Continental. So that was for me great because that was the opportunity to find the character and to experiment in all these different options. And, and we did many different options and, and we make him you know to kind of understand this guy and and yeah man and i i really like that chad gave me that time to kind of get deep there and and bring this personality of this guy you know because it's it's not the classic guy not the classic bad guy you know 
for me, it was a fun, fun character to discover, you know, through the process. I, I really like the how he came out, you know. And then, and then, and then the action scenes, and, and, and to answer the question, most of the action scenes were not on the script. My scene, my big scene was in the Osaka Continental and was uh, and all the scenes with the marquee and all that. But I was, remember I have this army of people. So I was sending the, my army of making the action. I was just there. But then Chad kind of was like, no, man, we, you know, you're going to go after him and you're going to do And I was so, you know, I was like, awesome. You know, I, I was like, man, a little kid with a new, with a new, you know, I was like so happy, man, you know, so that turned out like that. Like the, the fight in the stairs, that was not in the script. The fight in the Ark of Triumph was not in the script. It was me shooting, interacting very little, and but then it was him against all these people. So I'm so happy that he came out like that. What was the production, what was the production schedule on that scene with the cars? It was, a, oh, it was like a week night uh of all the whole thing because it was yeah it was it was long man yeah not all night all night well no that that's that was the moment that's the, my first interaction with Keanu yeah. because then we had the fight in the stairs right but the, that was the first time that I had to, to interact with him so you know that was the time where the first scene, bah, 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 and I wanted to change. So they showed me the choreography. Jeremy came to me. I was like, oh, what about this? What about... I wanted to change. I wanted to add a little more of a change of rhythm. You know, I, you know, so I wanted to add a double punch and like this type of things, right? So it, adds, it changed the rhythm. So I was getting myself in trouble because I was changing the rhythm of piano that had it memorized. So I knew that I was getting myself in a little trouble here, but I was like, oh, we'll make it happen. So it was me with him kind of going through it and then learning the tempo because he was like, pa, 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 boom, ra, da, 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 pa. like it, it, there was a change all the time of the rhythm. So it's kind of tough. Uh, and then he got it. He was really excited, man. And, and I did it the first time a little slow, then a little faster without touching. And then we did the first take and it's like, yeah, good. But then he came to me and like, you can give me some more. It's like, okay, cool. Da, 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 boom, pa, pa. And then we start hitting each other. I said, you can give me some more. So that was a good moment. I'm never going to forget because he, I saw him like he got really into it and he really wanted to work and really wanted to, so I could do the, this way, you know, and, and, and he, he, he was enjoying it and he was pushing himself too, you know, that was pretty cool. Yeah. It's kind of nice to be able to uh, improvise like that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, more, more than improvise, I think was just change the because the the choreography was set. I would I just change some beats, not in the take. Like we rehearse, we 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 change it and then we rehearse it to do it. It was more, yeah. So, I think Fist of the Condor is my favorite film that you've done. Um, can you talk about the uh, the inspirations for this Chilean condor martial art myth that you have in the film? <laughs> Oof, man, that's a long story, man. Look, man, this movie, it, this movie happened when I thought that the end of the world is going to be, it, well, when we were living the end of the world, in, in the middle of COVID, right? So I was in quarantine in isolated town with no one right because i didn't have a place to live i was visiting my family from from the u uh, from la in chile and then covid hit there's no way i can come back to la i didn't have a house to stay in chile so a friend of mine offered me this place and i started meditating and training that's the only thing that i was doing in my day because there was nothing to do everything was closed and man that was a a life of process and hours of meditating and contemplating this beautiful sunset, this beautiful sunrise. And I'm looking, I'm like, this is it, man. I'm, uh, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to live. I want to just totally be a nomad, a guy that it's, uh, you know, that has the minimum that go and get my food. I was going there and get the fish and eat. Not, not joke. Like this type of, it was crazy. And then I'm like, and suddenly I'm like talking with Ernesto and I'm running every day and I'm listening to this music. And I'm like, man, if this is the end, I have to do 
I have to show this. I have to show this journey, my training, my nutrition, how I can show this. We need to do, we need to do something to say to the world that I'm thankful for all my influences, that I'm thankful for the people that inspire me to be a martial artist. Because my conclusion was I'm I had a happy life. If this is the end, you know, you go into this process, right? If thinking this is the end of, of everything. And I said, I'm going to spend all my money that I don't care because I don't need the money. Now I can live here. You know, I'll just have a place where I can just get my food there. And I live with like $500 a month at the most. And that's it. So all the money that I have, I'll just spend it in this movie and I'll just put it out there. This, this is the, how it started. So then I gave all my notes to him of my nutrition, all everything we talk about, the nutrition, the training, the elastic, all the different phases of my training, my philosophy, everything. And Ernesto, and I said, look, this is what I want to say. Just let's put it together a story and let's do something to shoot here. And then we'll figure out which is how we're going to release it. And man, two months later, he came up with this script that I went crazy. I was like, man, we got to shoot this like a movie. So I started making my phone calls. Hey, man. And everybody was like not doing anything because it was all closed. So my friends that have cameras and like DP, like Nicolas, my producer, I want to do this, man. Can we put together a team and, 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 and you know, very small. We do everything in the out, outside, no problem with COVID. And they were like, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean. And then we end up doing this movie. And then, of course, the idea was, okay. We, our only challenge in this movie was to just be honest and be as much as like, uh, how do I say, transparent, trans transparent, like of what we are as filmmakers, as martial artists. We are Latinos, we're from a, another side of the world that got influence from these Asian movies that inspired us to be filmmakers and martial artists, right? So how we can make this version in with our Cordoba, with who we are, not trying to be them, but honoring them, making sure people understand the origin of this, but coming from our culture. So the first thing, our animal is the condor in our flag. So that is the biggest bird, you know, and, and so that's then in that moment, I was doing a lot of animal flow, like animal movements and stuff like that to warm up for my martial arts. So I'm like, okay, then I start exploring in my trainings. I start doing movements with the hands open and stuff like that. Then I go like, look, I did my own old wooden dummy back in the day for mandrill that I trained that I, I added these two hands up here. And it's different because I do MMA. So I block like this, right? So then every little, little detail like that, that has influenced me, but I've done it my own because I'm from this side, right? And I'm like, my, my music, my scenarios, my, the actors, the way we look, how we tell a story that belongs to this world, but from our, uh, from our, from our, our culture. And that's, that was our challenge with Fist of the Condor, to stay honest to that in every take, in every scene. And that's how it came out, you know, and, and you know, uh, and we start shooting. And then we didn't know what was going to happen. We just shoot it. We didn't, we were shooting and then we stopped. And we didn't have any way of finishing the production because, like I said, I didn't want to finish it amateur. I wanted to finish it pro. So I, I didn't finish the movie. And then I got John Wick. And, but we did a trailer. So then when I was traveling back to LA and things start opening, I send the trailer to JJ. And JJ texts me, Marco meet Chad, Chad meet Marco. And he introduced me to Chad to do the John Wick thing. So this movie has a very special thing that was the, the trigger for me to be in the biggest Hollywood action movie ever made. For me, it's like John Wick. It, it, it's, it, it's before and after John Wick you know and it is a very magical thing because i follow my intuition to do this movie I, I for me everything was telling me you're crazy everything everybody is like marco are you crazy like you should now thinking what you should do for your life movies are done theaters are done 
there's this is the end of that you need to like, like what are you going to do your living and i'm like and then my brain was all the time telling me this and and for some reason i have this intuition no i'll do that but first i have to do this <laughs> i need to if i'm going to close this circle this cycle is going to be with something that represents me a hundred percent who i am and when if i'm not here People are going to see this and they're going to understand who I am as a human being, as a martial artist. And this is what I want to do. And that's Fist of the Condor. It was pretty, pretty personal project. And, and for me, that's very uh, nice to, to see what's happening with that movie because it comes from a very personal place, you know. So you were able to go back and finish the film after John Wick 4? Yeah, we know. We finished the post. Because it was totally fi finished, done, and, and we just finished uh, post production. Because with Fist of the when John Wick ha happened, then I start like uh, putting together a trailer and do finishing the offline, and then showing the offline to different distributors, and then Welgo came up and and uh, offered me, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, to be distributors, and that was a game changer for Fist of the Condor. Was it the same action team that you had used in the past as well? No, we kind of did. You have to rebuild the whole, like, not too, not too much. Like, I use actors in this one, and I and I select, like, for example, the guy in the forest is part of the Kiltro stunt team. Uh, Victor Gonzalez is a stunt team too from the from the same team. Eyal Mayer is an actor, dramatic actor that is a uh, Kaladi master, and then the Asian actor it's uh, from Kiltro too. You know, and so there was no a lot of stunt work. And the the, the old stunt team did the, the thing in the bar, the fight at the bar, they did some stunts, but it was very specific uh, what they did. And yeah, man, and actually I gotta say thanks to Scott because Scott helped me to find Welgo, Scott Atkins. We've been talking all the time to work together and then he introduced me to Welgo, man, and, and they, took, they took my movie. So yeah, man. <laughs> Any plans for a sequel? Well, that would be my dream, man. I want to do the fight between the two brothers, man. That's a big challenge. That's that's one of that. I would love to do that. I would love to do that. Uh, uh, yeah, it depends on the performance. Like if, if the movie gets the attention and the people, the movie gets the love from the fans, they're gonna do it. They already told me. So I'm actually waiting for that. You know, for to know what's gonna happen. You know. What would you say is your least favorite part of the action filmmaking process? In my movies, like in my product size production, that you don't have time, that you always will love. Oh, what happened if I would have one more day for this fight scene? <laughs> yes, like the, that. Like yeah, I think that's that's kind of like the frustration. That when you see it, you go, ah, you know, uh, I could, if I could have a little bit more money to have more days, you know, always on the, on the, on that, on the, on the rush, you know. What was your production schedule on Fist of the Condor? We have a, we shot, um, actually, you know what? I was, a, it was a good thing that I think the quarantine was very good for Fist of the Condor because we had such a low budget that we needed to plan very good. So we shot, it's the first time I shoot a movie like this. So we shoot one week and then we stop shooting. One, two weeks, three weeks, and then we shoot another week and then we stop shooting. One, two, three, one week. Because of what? Because of quarantines, because of permits or like illegal, like the, you cannot cross to that area because it's now it's in zone A, you know, different zones of COVID where you cannot move around or blah, blah, blah. Or you can only have five people on the same place. So then you move to zone three. Now you can have 10 people on the same place. Okay, now we can shoot this week because if not, we cannot shoot. So these, these but what happened is because we were waiting, we were prepping. So those weeks that we were not wait, we were not shooting, we were prepping that week so good. So Ernesto was able to do almost every storyboard. I was able to have the previous very so you know, know to know what we're doing. Like production was able. To, so I think every week was very prepared, and that was the positive thing of it. You know, uh, there's another fan question. 
uh, what are your top five martial art movies? It's uh, a very fan, very fan question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, Enter the Dragon, of course. Well, the thing is that if if we count all the Bruce Lee movies, then that's my five. Like I, then you I, run out. I, of it. I run out of it. But we mixing it up. I think Enter the Dragon, Armor of God, uh, No Retreat, No Surrender. Re yeah, you know the one that Bruce Lee show up to the. I love because I always wanted that to happen to me. I remember when I see in the film, it's like, oh my god, this is a dream, you know. And the guy training with Bruce Lee on the side. I actually, I kind of yeah. I had some moments like that that I really thought that Bruce Lee was next to me training me when I was a kid. So yeah, so that um, I well I love the quest of Van Damme. The quest was pretty pretty cool. Kid boxer of course of Van Damme was pretty cool. Rumble in the Bronx, um, Jackie Chan. There's another movie of Jackie Chan that I really like, and I don't I I think people it's not the favorite of the people, but I I actually like it. I don't remember the name. Is the one that there's he goes to a tournament to fight and he fights very funny characters. And then he has a scene with the roller skates and he he's in roller skates fighting and in the in a theater. It's a very cool I I remember this. Ah, you know what movie I love? Remo Williams. Oh my god, that movie, man. That movie was awesome. I love that movie. That's a fun one. It's a fun how, one. Yeah. How do you watch movies and what what do you look for or what do you look at when you're watching an action movie? You know what? Today, to be honest, I'm not a very big fan of action movies, man. I, I, when I watch movies, I like to get emotionally involved. So for me, a movie needs to get me emotionally involved. Like if, because I, I love to feel things, you know, to engage in a way that, and if an action movie can do it, that's great. But I think what a lot of action movie fails is that they pay too much attention in the action and they kind of leave, they leave too much on the side, the engagement, uh, emotionally engagement. And I think that, you know, for example, I believe, even though, believe it or not, I well, maybe it's not a fair thing to say, but I, I really felt in the last John Wake man, Man, that final scene it was it was beautiful, man. You know, I really love the thing that these these two friends and and then and then John Wick Carter decides not to shoot, and it was it was such a good ending, man. Like literally, like after all this craziness and action, and then engaging like that with the character was pretty cool. I think that's why the movie did that good, you know, because it really engaged. I I, I look that I look for engagement with the characters. I can, there's so much action you can see, you know. Today you watch UFC, you can see people fighting better than any movie. So how are you gonna beat that in a movie if it's a movie? Better you just put YouTube and you just people doing some crazy stuff. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think the beauty of filmmaking is how you make that engagement and you you take them out of their reality and you bring them a little bit to this side and to make them feel and make them they make them have this adrenaline or emotions that you give them a new experience, a different experience. And I think that's a challenge, you know. Do you think fatherhood changed how you watch movies and how you make movies? I feel not yet. I, I've been attached with, I've been like this more than, I, I you know, my, my daughter is pretty uh, little, uh, so only one year and a half. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this has been coming from behind, from, from back. Um, I cannot wait to take her to the movies though and experience that with her though. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious, what, what, a guy like you that I I, I do admire of, you, of what you've done and and your your you're so good at what you do, man. And I would like to hear what why Fist of the Condor is your favorite. Like, what's the what 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 cultivate you from Fist of the Condor? Um, I'm a little bit of an anthropology nut. I do, you know, I I, I read and uh and I've been to Chile also, and I oh. I had a. A lovely time in Chile. And that's actually where our company was started. Um, and I can tell you more about that offline. But anytime you have, how do I explain it? You know, there are times when people 
will try and force an aesthetic. For example, um, uh, if you if you were to try and make a new martial arts style based on some kind of fake myth, right, whatever it might be, or some kind of cultural myth, and there's some times where it just doesn't feel like it it like it's real, like it doesn't like it doesn't exist there. Uh, but the way that the movements come together in this and the, the training montage, there's a lore to it. There's a look, there's the costuming. It all just felt like it felt like it was really there. So oh. I commend you and Ernesto for that. And uh, and I think that that's the kind of immersion that is really compelling. You know, cool, man. Cool. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I was very I needed to make this question because. You know, I know you, I, I know that you're, you're like me, you're a fan. And for me, your opinion counts a lot, you know, and it's cool, man. You know, it's, well, it's, well, like it's, when you, when you have, when you have stuff that's new, right. You, and you have, like you said, you, the villain, right. Was the Kalari expert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He moves different. He doesn't move like somebody who's trained in wushu and now he's getting into stunts right like we all know what that movement is going to look like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. there's this there is this sort of i don't know there's sort of a canned movement style that is very easy to fall into and yeah. i think a lot of us are very sensitive to that we try and get out of that and yes yes yeah actually it's very good that you mentioned because it happens to me like when I see these films of this, so they're doing a lot of martial art movies and every show now they have fight scenes and stuff like that. And and it's like, you can feel the rhythm or you can, there's something that it, it falls into this music that is ter it turns to be tedious a little bit. And, and no matter what colorful moves you're doing or whatever, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't hit you. It doesn't, you know, uh, and I think going back to Bruce Lee, I think that's what he was such good at it. He was always always surprising you, always changing the, the rhythms. And he was so much emotionally involved in everything. So I think it's my best way to explain. And, and, and I try when I do my things, it's like to don't lose that, to don't lose that emotional connection with what I'm doing and then the purpose that I'm doing it in, in the Feast of the Condor, like it was a, I was lucky to find a Kalari a, a, a Yal, for example, that put me in a way in a context that I needed to change, I needed to to explore, and I needed to put myself in a different reality when I was doing a choreography, you know. So that brain kind of like a different rhythm, a different way. It was, it felt different, and you know. And each fight of that movie was kind of like that because it was different kind of character, very strong purpose for the scene. But, you know, and I don't know. And I think that's a, it's a challenge for all of us when we're doing fights because, you know, there's a lot of good people doing it. But what you just said is there's something that I don't know how to explain it. And it's curious that you mention it because it happens the same to me when I see these fight scenes, you know. I think I, I think it's probably a universal thing. Well, some people seem to find the thing that they are good at and they just keep doing that. And I mean, I guess the problem is that you can keep doing that and make a career out of that. <laughs> but yes. if you really want to bring something new, on the one hand, that's a risk, right? Because you're saying, well, I'm going to make a new kind of action style. And sometimes people financially are kind of, well, no, I'll just... I'll just put my money in the thing that I know works. Uh, but then when you actually succeed in doing that, uh, then that's when you start seeing change. So I think that that's worth emulating. Mm -hmm. So Marco, thank you again. Uh, it's been yeah, a real pleasure. It was fun, man. Fun, fun talk, man. Thanks. Thanks for the time too. And, and thanks for the, for the invite, man. Yeah, man. This has been an interview with Marco Zoror. Action Talks is available on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify. Join my telegram at t.me slash ericjacobus. You can check out my studio at superalloyinteractive.com. My website and blog is at ericjacobus.com. And be sure to subscribe. Thank you.